Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for joining us for our second eLife Hangout on Air. I'm Jenny and I work for the eLife team. We're here today to chat to the latest participants of the eLife sponsored presentation series. We'll also be announcing the next round of participants at the end of this Hangout. eLife started this series with the aim of supporting early career researchers because we understand that there are a lot of challenges and pressures associated with this stage in a researcher's career. So this is our way of highlighting some of the outstanding work that early career researchers have published with us. This time around, we've got we've sponsored five researchers to present their work at our founding institutions, uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Max Planck Society, and the Wellcome Trust. Three of these researchers will be joining us today to talk to Dr. Chris Smith, who will be moderating the Hangout for us. Chris is a medical consultant specializing in clinical microbiology and virology at Cambridge University and its teaching hospital. He's also the founder of the Naked Scientists, a media savvy group of physicians and researchers at Cambridge University. He uses the radio and live lectures to strip science down to its bare essentials and promote it to the general public. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Chris now to introduce all the participants. Hello Jenny, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Let me tell you uh, who we have lined up for you. Stephen Baker is from Oxford University. He's supported by the Wellcome Trust and he's based in Vietnam. He works on gut bugs including Shigella and Salmonella and also how viral infections spread between animals and humans. That'll be an infectious listen. Also Chris Huttenhauer is from Harvard School of Public Health. He's developing computational methods for studying communities of microbes. He's trying to use this technology to understand diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and how we can use that work diagnostic and Rajat Rahatki is in the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford University School of Medicine. He's an oncologist with an interest in treating patients with lung cancer. Uh, Raj will be joining us later because he can't make the initial part of the discussion. So we'll first of all focus on the work being done by Stephen and also by Chris. Stephen, why don't we kick off with yourself. What can you tell us about why you're in Vietnam and what sorts of questions you're asking of the populace around there? Uh, so I've actually I've been in Vietnam for some time now. I, I came to Vietnam as a postdoc in 2007, and the reason I came to Vietnam is because I was working in the UK and uh, I was interested in gastrointestinal infections, particularly typhoid fever. There was an opportunity to come and work in Asia and study it in a place where typhoid fever was actually a problem uh, and get more uh, hands-on kind of clinical microbiology experience. So so I uprooted myself and I moved over to Vietnam and then I've since developed my own research interests on my own research group uh, and I've had a couple of uh, reasonable grants from the Wellcome Trust which have put me in the position now where uh, we're developing a fairly substantial group studying a range of different gastrointestinal pathogens including bacteria, viruses and, and actually more recently parasites. What can you tell us about what typhoid and Shigella are how they cause disease and how common they are around the world and especially in Vietnam? Yeah, so um, so they have some similarities and some differences. Um, it's no um, coincidence that I, that I work on both of them because of their similarities. So typhoid fever is the causative agent, sorry, salmonella typhoid is the causative agent of typhoid fever. Uh, it's a gram-negative bacteria uh, and it's evolved away from the other salmonella uh, organisms to cause the human restricted disease typhoid. So it actually has the ability uh, to invade the gastrointestinal wall and then spread systemically around the body inside macrophages which causes the, the febrile part of the disease. So it's um, fatal in about 20 to 30 percent of people that don't receive appropriate antimicrobial therapy and it's particularly common in parts of Southeast and South Asia and also now there's an ongoing epidemic in parts of Africa. So that's typhoid. Shigella is much more common than typhoid and is found in almost every country in the world, not, not just through imported infections but also endemically. It's a gastrointestinal infection which mainly infects children and the organism, instead of invading the gastrointestinal wall and spreading systemically, it actually invades locally within the gastrointestinal wall, spreading from cell to cell and causing tissue destruction and gives you a fairly nasty bout of diarrheal disease um, which contains uh, blood and mucus in the stool because of the tissue destruction. So 
we're interested in the epidemiology and the genomics and also drug resistance patterns of both of those organisms to try and understand how to treat them and, and how to combat them more in, in the environment. How do most people catch these diseases? So, um, well, that's, uh, that's, well, that's an interesting question. So, um, they're both fecal or orally transmitted. So, uh, they're transmitted through uh, contact with contaminated food or water. Uh, but the big belief for typhoid fever was that you actually caught it from uh, contact with people that were acutely or chronically shedding the organism after infection. Some of our data questions that a little bit and suggest that probably it is more likely you actually uh, contract it through drinking contaminated water in places where it's endemic. So people that live there are probably continually exposed um, and build up immunity, but people moving into a region where it's endemic or, or travelers are probably at higher risk than others because they have not, no background immunity to it. Is typhoid Mary then a myth? We know she existed. We know that we went past 100 years recently of the death of typhoid Mary. I'm not sure whether we should celebrate that or not, but are you saying then that the majority of cases are not cropping up because there are people like her in the population, or is it six of one, half a dozen of another? That's a very, again, that's a very good question. So typhoid Mary uh, probably at the time was a bit of a scapegoat for what was going on with typhoid in New York uh, and was blamed for a, for a fair amount of uh, typhoid illnesses in, in, in individuals that she's supposed to have contact with. Actually, I think that um, and carriers in a, in a fairly reasonable transmission setting, so at the, the turn of the 20th century in New York, there was still a fair burden of typhoid fever. Actually, again, our data suggests that probably typhoid carriers play a very, very limited role in actually circulating the organism, and it's probably more due to contamination of the local environment or, or contact with acute carriers rather than chronic carriers. If we're looking in places where the, or the disease is on the decline, on the wane, where it, where it still continues but is, has a lower incidence, then probably carriers become more important because as uh, there's less transmission through the environment, then there tends to be disease is more associated probably with people that are carrying the organism. What are you learning, um, Stephen, about how people treat these disorders and the role of antibiotics and what's happening to the response of these organisms to antibiotics as we use more of them more of the time? Well, I, I mean, I've been working on antimicrobial resistance for some time. The, it's very much in the public eye at the moment, very much in, in the eye of uh, funding agencies in, in, in Europe specifically. If I'm, if I'm being brutally honest without wanting to sound fairly melodramatic, I think that the issue with drug resistance here is probably an order of magnitude greater um, than what we're seeing in the UK, in the US, in Europe. So drug resistance is a huge problem in developing countries, not just with typhoid or with Shigella, but with other, other gram-negative and gram-positive organisms. So with Why typhoid, well, probably due to increased selective pressure. So antimicrobials are, are available here at a range of different facilities, including clinicians uh, in some shops, pharmacies, you don't need a prescription. Uh, then they're not regulated in farming, uh, they're not regulated in the production of, of vegetables or fruit. So probably the amount of antimicrobials that we're longitudinally exposed to in places like not just Vietnam but other parts of Southeast Asia is probably greater than everywhere else. And I think that actually it's probably not driven by specifically treatment of the organism but maybe also driven by just general exposure and competition uh, in, in the gastrointestinal tract from other organisms that are naturally resistant um, or becoming naturally resistant to the antimicrobials they're exposed to in the environment. So does this mean that if you pick up one of these organisms in a place like Vietnam, you're more likely to acquire a de novo, in other words, from the get-go infection, with something that's resistant compared with if you were to pick it up somewhere else? I think that... Um, I, I don't know if that's true. I, I think that antimicrobial resistance in, in some pathogens is a problem everywhere. I think that um, certainly some places have more antimicrobial resistant uh, cases of typhoid fever than other places. So that, that is location dependent. But my, my, our current, again, our current data suggests that actually if you come to places like Vietnam and South Asia, you're naturally more likely to pick up organisms uh, that contain drug resistance uh, cassettes, uh, whether they're pathogenic or not. And what would you say the major risk is? If it stays in Vietnam, that's just a problem for Vietnam, isn't it? 
or is this a major threat to the rest of the world? No, this is a major threat everywhere. I, I, the, I think that um, there was the, the case of the uh, the famous now NDM1 gene that was um, that was first isolated in in India and that found its way into the healthcare system in the UK. Uh, these resistance cassettes are, are fairly well distributed around Asia and are propping up cropping up all over the world now. I think that um, that we're, we're we're finding relatively new resistance genes in low proportion and then seeing them. Uh, expand over a period of time, and I think this is not just a local problem, but it's becoming a regional and also a, an international problem. What about your other interests, which include the other aspects of the microbial spectrum, viruses, and how they pose a threat to people, particularly when they jump out of one host species and get into humans? Yeah, again, that's very topical at the moment because of the Ebola epidemic. So. Uh, again, I, I have a, a Wellcome Trust funded project whereby we're actually uh, performing a, a longitudinal study uh, looking for diseases of unknown origin. So these are diseases that we see in, in hospitals around Vietnam from people with particular syndromes that we can't find an etiological agent for and we're trying to investigate what those etiological agents may be. So we're looking for things uh, that we can't diagnose particularly well to try and work out uh, what's causing them. And on the back of that, we've also got a cohort of individuals uh, in three different uh, provinces around the country uh, that we're sampling longitudinally in their animals to try and document the viral diversity on both sides of the species barrier between humans and animals. And then also when they get sick, uh, we sample them and their animals as well to see how much or what the opportunity is for viral transfer between animals and humans, which may be a pathogen pathogenic origin. What are you finding? Well, we're finding lots of things. Well, what we're finding is actually there's a huge amount of undiagnosed disease in hospitals. Um, we're finding uh, a wide range of various um, picorna viruses and flaviviruses that are circulating in, in animals which tend not to spread so much into humans. We're finding a fair amount of influenza which is coming from animals which probably is spreading into humans. And we're also finding a, a fairly uh, wide range of gastrointestinal viruses um, that, are, that are circulating in animals that are spreading to humans, which may or may not be causing disease. So is it fair to say then you, you could catch diarrhea from your dog? Uh, yeah, so uh, dogs are one of the animals that we're sampling, and we think that probably dogs are fairly good reservoir of uh, Khaleesi viruses, and we know that Khaleesi viruses, some of them are good at causing diarrhea in humans, so we think that dogs, not just dogs, but also pigs and other things are probably good reservoirs of various gastrointestinal pathogens. So before you kiss your dog next time, just think about what it's been kissing first. You might catch diarrhea from your dog. Thank you very much. Stephen well, Baker from the University of Oxford and he's based in Vietnam. We should say at this point, if you have any questions for either Stephen based on what he was saying or our next speaker who's Chris Huttenhauer from Harvard, you can send those in. It might be a good idea for Jenny to mention at this point how people should get in touch with us um, to put their questions in. I presume you'll be receiving those questions, Jenny, and then you can you can field them for us. Yes, yeah, so people can either um, tweet to us on Twitter or there's also, um, there should be a button on everyone's screens that is, allows the Q&A function and you can ask a question on there. And the Twitter handle, if people want to tweet at you, uh, is? It's hashtag eLifeHOA. Perfect. It, just in case it broke up for anybody, could you just do it again and subject you to a, a repetition, please, Jenny? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's uh, hashtag eLifeHOA. Super. So any questions related to anything that Stephen was saying or anything we're now going to speak about? Because Chris Huttenhauer is from Harvard School of Public Health. He's developing computational methods for studying microbial communities and he's trying to use this technology to understand how diseases like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis actually cause disease and also change the microbial spectrum in the intestine so we might be able to understand how to diagnose these things better if we can understand what the bugs are doing. Hello Chris. Hello. So tell us Chris um, a, a, in a little bit more detail what it is you actually do. So our lab uh, does a combination of computational methods development to understand microbial community function um, and a handful of applied studies using computational techniques um, 
in the human microbiome, mainly in um, autoimmune and inflammatory conditions like Crohn's disease and also ulcerative colitis, the inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, and we've also worked a little in areas like rheumatoid arthritis um, in the, the project that um, got us involved with eLife today. Um, through a collaboration with Dan Lipman, where we we're looking at the role of specifically um, Prevotella copri as it interacts with the gut microbiome during uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So most of our work focuses on um, what can be called commensal organisms, sort of the normal human microbiome, um, and how that's perturbed in more complex ways during, say, chronic disease rather than acutely by pathogens during infectious disease. It's interesting, isn't it, how increasingly in every aspect of disease that we study these days, we find that a disease in one part of the body is often impacting on what's going on in the intestine. It, it almost is a case of you, you quite literally are what you eat. Uh, to a degree. I, the extent to which the gut microbiome in particular ha has been well studied and interacts with the innate and adaptive immune system um, has sort of put it in the spotlight recently. Um, as you mentioned during, during my introduction at the beginning, one of the reasons that I'm particularly excited about the area is that um, the gut microbiome in particular is, is easily accessible as a diagnostic readout. Um, in as much as nobody really likes to do it, it's fairly easy to provide a stool sample and use that as a high throughput readout of gut microbiome status. Um, so there's a lot of interest in developing uh, diagnostics or prognostics based on the microbial status in the gut. Um, over the longer term, it's, it's exciting in as much as the gut microbiome is in principle modifiable. Um, outside of extreme cases like uh, fecal microbiome transplants for uh, cases like cl uh, Clostridium difficile infection, we don't have a, a great handle on how to modify the gut microbiome in directed manners yet, um, but it's definitely possible in principle and, and something else um, of interest to work towards in the longer term. I was reading a paper, just not in eLife, but in another August journal a couple of weeks ago, and they were actually showing, look, if you take animals that don't have bacteria in their guts when they're born, they don't get a properly intact blood-brain barrier. And it's just interesting how you look at the range and diversity of organisms that live in your intestines and how this impacts on the development of things as remote as the nervous system away from the gut. And in, it looks like there is this very strong relationship between what is going on intestinally in terms of these communities and metabolic phenomena all over the body. And it's, it's been known for a long time that, for example, germ-free mice have really gross physiological um, differences in developments ranging from the GI tract to nervous system development. Um, I'm, I'm currently visiting the, the University of Oregon from the Harvard School of Public Health um, and working with some of the microbial ecologists and, and uh, notobiotic zebrafish folks here. And uh, germ-free zebrafish have similar um, sort of gross physiological and developmental issues um, when, when raised germ-free, just due to the, the lack of gut microbes. Um, in, in humans, uh, one of the areas that I'm interested in where this plays out is um, the hygiene hypothesis. In as much as humans generally aren't uh, germ-free, um, there does seem to be a, a very strong influence of perturbations to the gut microbiome during the first few years of life, um, both observationally there are large changes over the first two to three years of life uh, while the gut microbiome is acquired and stabilizes and infants shift from, uh, for example, uh, breastfeeding or formula feeding to solid food. Um, one of the other projects we're working on now with um, Prominic Xavier at the Broad and with uh, Mikhail Nip in Finland is uh, observation of a, a cohort of children there who are at risk for developing type 1 diabetes as another member of the sort of uh, chronic autoimmune inflammatory um, uh, disease set that seem to share these uh, linked mechanisms in the gut microbiome. Um, so there we're watching what happens during acquisition of the microbiome within the first few years of life and how that's affected not just by, for example, uh, genetic risk of uh, type 1 diabetes from the host side, but by environmental factors like exactly when you receive uh, what dietary components during weaning or um, what uh, medications or things like antibiotic exposures early in life. 
And you're aiming to develop methods to try to quantify and follow these populations to show how the different taxa, the different groups of microorganisms in an individual wax and wane and change in response to different stimuli. More or less. There, I'd say the two areas that we're, we're working in computationally right now um, one is in methods development for uh, observing individuals over time, for, for managing uh, microbial community analyses as um, longitudinal time courses. Uh, that's important in that study. It's important in a couple of the uh, ongoing inflammatory bowel disease studies that we're doing now. Since um, one of the things that's, that's uh, become more apparent in the past few years is that due to the uh, potentially very large differences between individuals as far as, for example, microbial community composition, it's often very uh, more informative to observe an individual over time than to do, say, large cross-sectional analyses, since there are large baseline differences that make it tough to compare individuals in terms of things like, say, gut microbiome composition. Um, the second area where we're, we're uh, focusing on methods development is in getting a more functional or molecular or more metabolic perspective on uh, the gut microbiome. Um, there have been a, a couple of nice results now between our lab and, and other groups who have seen similar things that um, there can be both components of gut microbiome stability that are linked to uh, the distribution of, of different metabolic functions throughout the community rather than individual uh, community members and also that uh, some of the perturbations that might be of interest in chronic disease are linked to um, metabolic perturbations. So rather than, say, an individual pathogen invading and disrupting the community, there is a disruption in, uh, in responsibilities in, in which metabolic functions or signaling functions are carried out by different organisms. Um, so we've been working on uh, methods to make sequencing and other types of high throughput data more amenable to analyses that focus on molecular function and pathway composition and metabolism in addition to just which organisms are there. Chris, thank you very much. Chris Hardenhauer is from Harvard School of Public Health and he, as you heard, is developing computational methods for studying the communities of microorganisms which live in us and on us. And just to reiterate, if you would like to ask any questions of either Stephen, who you heard first, or Chris, who you've just been hearing from, or our next guest, who is Rajat Rahatji, then you can send those in. You can tweet, you can tweet and here's Jenny with an update on how you tweet at eLife. I can't hear you, Jenny. I think you're off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you can tweet using the hashtag, um, hashtag at eLifeHOA, or you can also just tweet with our at eLife in the username, and we'll get it. Thank you. Any questions for any of our guests? So let's move on. Uh, Rajat Rohatji, and I hope I've said your name correctly, Raj, uh, is from the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford University School of Medicine, where he is an oncologist with an interest in lung cancer. Welcome, and I'm glad you're able to join us. I know you're in a meeting just before we started. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Tell us a bit about your work. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, loud and clear. Go okay. ahead. Great. Um, so I'm an oncologist at Stanford and uh, I actually belong to two departments, medicine and biochemistry. Um, and uh, in a general sense, my lab is interested in uh, developmental pathways that are co-opted by tumor cells. Um, and in this respect, uh, our, our, one of our major focuses over the past few years really has been on the hedgehog signal construction cascade. Um, hedgehog is one of the five or six sort of pillars of development uh, in, in actually all animals and, and controls um, development of almost all tissues really. It's hard to find a structure that's not regulated by hedgehog signaling. Um, and it's also become clear like with many of these pathways that hedgehog plays an important role in human diseases. So uh, for example, hedgehog uh, defects lead to congenital anomalies in humans. Uh, and uh, a little bit from my sort of clinical interest, uh, um, Constitutive activation of the hedgehog pathway has been uh, shown to be important for certain types of cancers of the skin and the brain. And, uh, and, and for example, just a couple of years ago, we had the first FDA-approved drug uh, that uh, uh, targets hedgehog signaling. Um, 
Um, the work described in the in the um, uh, eLife study uh, relates to a, a uh, sort of mysterious and poorly understood step in the hedgehog pathway. So, uh, just for a little bit of context, uh, one of the major proteins in the hedgehog cascade uh, that is conserved actually in all animals, from flies to vertebrates. Uh, is the protein smoothen, which uh, uh, belongs to the G-protein coupled receptor superfamily. And smoothen is important because it's a single important node in the signaling pathway. It's actually the target of all clinically used uh, 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 anti-hedgehog therapies, uh, yet the mechanism by which smoothen is activated has remained sort of uncertain, uh, uh, both in, uh, in, in flies all the way to, uh, uh, all the way to vertebrates. So, so my lab is interested in sort of Sorry two areas. Sorry to interrupt, Raj, just at yeah. this stage. Um, do you mean that this, this gene smoothened is actually intrinsically part of the hedgehog signaling cascade, or is it downstream of hedgehog? Does hedgehog interact with this? Is this a target for hedgehog? How does it fit into the jigsaw? I'm not quite clear. Yeah, sure. So um, hedgehog, like other signaling pathways, has a ligand, a secreted ligand, and in vertebrates, it's one of three proteins, uh, including a protein called sonic hedgehog. Uh, it binds to its receptor. Uh, the receptor is actually a multi-pass transmembrane protein called PATCHED. Uh, uh, PATCHED is a human tumor suppressor. And then in some way that we don't understand, PATCHED in turn regulates smoothened. So smoothened is the molecule actually that transmits the hedgehog signal across the membrane, uh, but, uh, but not directly by binding to the ligand, but by, by, by working one step downstream. So smoothened is required really to transmit the And how did you establish so and how did you establish that smoothened is involved in the process of cancer? How is it linked in the first place to no, the cancer process? Work. Yeah, this is not this is not our work. This is work that was done um, uh, uh, many many years ago uh, in the 90s, really, uh, when uh, several investigators discovered that mutations in the hedgehog pathway genes, including patched and smoothened, are responsible for. Uh, cancers of the skin, such as basal cell cancers, as well as cancers of the brain, such as medulloblastoma. So that was sort of the work that implicated the hedgehog cascade, as well as smoothened uh, uh, in human cancer. Um, indeed, you can find mutations in smoothened that lead to its constitutive uh, or unrestrained activity uh, in uh, both of those tumors. And are these mutations causal? Do they directly drive the cancers in the first place from the get-go? Or are they just a reflection on the fact that you have a genetic instability in cells that leads to the cancer in the first place, and this is one consequence? Um, it's pretty clear, I think, that the mutations are indeed causal. Um, and in fact, they can drive tumors both in humans and in other mouse models. Um, I should say that Which is the why getting at the root of them will, will actually stop the process, which is why it's therefore a good therapeutic target. Exactly. Uh, the most common mutation you see in human cancers is actually disruption of the receptor patched, uh, loss of function mutations in patched, and what this allows is it allows Smoothen to adopt a constitutively active conformation. So, um, Why do you think it is so commonly affected? Do you think this is a fact that because it has such an instrumental role in early embryology, driving the behavior of so many tissues, it's therefore got a lot of power as a cellular control factor and therefore it's not surprising that if you mutate it, you then get all kinds of growth-related consequences. Uh, yes, I mean, I should just uh, say that uh, mutations in the hedgehog pathway, uh, at least in terms of uh, uh, genetic or driver causes of cancer, really are restricted to certain tumor subtypes, such as basal cell cancer and medulloblastoma. Um, and, uh, and you're exactly right in making the observation that these developmental pathways uh, control many very sophisticated functions during development, such as not just cell growth, which, which obviously we know to be important for cancer, but things like morphogenesis or invasion or differentiation. Um, and in fact, these sort of latter characteristics of tumors are often, uh, you know, based on what we see in the clinic, really much harder to deal with uh, than just cell proliferation, which is why I think there's an increasing appreciation that oftentimes tumors will hijack pathways like hedgehog or wint or notch um, um, to, to really gain an advantage uh, beyond just proliferation. And the treatments that you've been developing uh, and target this approach, are they successful? 
So uh, the, the treatments that have been developed against the hedgehog pathway uh, uh, by, uh, by many groups and many companies uh, are very, very effective against tumors that are driven by mutations in the pathway. So these were established by a series of phase three trials uh, in basal cell cancer, which is a, which is a classical hedgehog-driven tumor. Um, but uh, like with many targeted therapies, a major problem is resistance. So for example, in basal cell tumors, uh, you often get second site mutations in smoothened uh, that either prevent drug binding or prevent drug efficacy and make these tumors resistant uh, um, to therapy. So there's still a great deal of interest to, in, in identifying better inhibitors or developing orthogonal ways to block the pathway. And how are you applying this in the context of lung cancer? So the, the work in our lab uh, is, uh, uh, the, the Hedgehog project really is not directly linked to any specific uh, subtype of tumor. Um, in fact, uh, there is relatively little evidence that uh, hedgehog signaling is important in, in uh, the most common cause of lung, lung cancer, which is adenocarcinoma, although there is a trial, uh, ongoing trial, that looks at hedgehog pathway modulation uh, in uh, small cell lung cancer, sort of highly smoking associated lethal tumor uh, on which we have made essentially no progress. So we'll see what that trial shows. Uh, but I, the, the Hedgehog Project in my lab is, is uh, you know, we don't necessarily link it directly to what I do clinically. I'm, I'm an oncologist, I'm interested in cancer, and so, um, you know, we go where the biology takes us in terms of the tumor type uh, to speak, to, so to say. And what, are there any other aspects of this work that you think we, we should hear about here on the eLife Hangout today? So I think the, the, the one other point I would like to make is that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the surprising thing about the study that we published in eLife was, uh, was the fact that I think we started with really a very old observation in the hedgehog field, which is that sterols, so cholesterol-related molecules, uh, can influence the pathway. Um, and this has been known for, for uh, many years, and, and subsequently uh, people uncovered that, uh, uh, that certain oxidized cholesterol metabolites, called the oxysterols, uh, are potent activators of signaling. And, and uh, this observation sort of uh, lay in the literature for a significant period of time uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that because I think figuring out how metabolites work is often difficult, and, and, uh, and in many cases, people attribute effects of uh, lipid metabolites or sterile metabolites as being sort of non-specific non -specific effects on membrane function, especially membrane protein function. And I think what's interesting is that by, by actually figuring out how these oxysterols work, uh, we made a couple of very surprising observations. One is that they work in a very specific manner by binding to smoothen, and that they do so at a binding site that had really not been studied or even known to exist uh, prior to this work. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a, there's a general lesson here, which I think is, for us at least, means that uh, sterile metabolites, other metabolites, and lipids in cells probably regulate very specific steps in signaling pathways. Um, and it's just a question of us developing the methods to probe this. Raj, thank you very much. Uh, Raj at uh, Rohatchi is from the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford School of Medicine. Uh, that's where he's a practicing oncologist and also a scientist. So you've heard from our three scientists today. Stephen Baker, who was up first, he's based in Vietnam. He's interested in various infections and how they may transmit between animals and humans or things that humans can give each other. That they include intestinal infections like Salmonella and Shigella and also other viral entities which live in animals and even your pet dog and can transmit into humans. Chris Huttenhauer uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health is interested in computational methods to understand how the microbes living on us and in us are influenced by what we do, what we eat and who we are and also the changes in those microbial populations that are associated with various disease processes and also nutritional processes where the breastfeeding actually has an influence on health because it influences your gut bugs. Who knows? And we've just heard from, from Rajat on his work on various aspects of the genomics of cancer and certain types of cancer and how we can employ those processes in order to treat cancer better. If you have any questions, then you can send those in right now. Jenny will give you the contact details of how you get in touch, and then we can begin having your questions and answers answered by our panel. Jenny.
Okay, so if anyone's watching on Google+, Plus, if you look in the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little box with about nine boxes in it. Um, if you click on that, you can access the Q&A function, and then you can just type your question in, and we'll see them. Otherwise, you can tweet in your question with hashtag eLifeHOA. Um, we've actually had a question, if you want me to read it to you, Chris. You fire away, please. Okay, so this one's for Curtis. Um, what far-reaching medical implications do you see of sequencing the gut microbiome? Well, that's that's a big one. Um, there there are lots of possible answers to that. Some some of which touch more closely at our work. Some some of which deal with with that of others in in the field at this point. Um, one of the, the ways in which I like to think of the, the work that's been done on the gut microbiome and the human microbiome generally in the, the past few years from a, a medical perspective is, is in those two chunks that I mentioned earlier. One in terms of diagnostics and being able to use the gut microbiome or, or other human-associated microbes as a readout of health or prognostic for established disease. The other is in terms of, of um, modifications or therapeutics to improve disease outcome. Um, there are also implications in terms of, say, early life exposures and how we think about medical practice. Um, there's been a lot of great work, for example, on antibiotic exposures in the first few years of life and how those might act on the developing gut and, and other microbial communities. Um, or even in, in areas like how the human microbiome interacts with our surroundings to transmit either commensal or um, potentially pathogenic organisms that are part of the, the normal microbiome to our surroundings and then uh, back again. So thinking, for example, about the um, antimicrobial resistance that was mentioned earlier, there's even been work in terms of how the human microbiome harbors antimicrobial resistance cassettes or organisms and can transmit those sort of silently from individual to individual or, or to our surroundings. Um, so in a, a broad sense, there's at least those three areas in which the, the better understanding of the human microbiome that's developed in the past few years um, can and, and hopefully will uh, start to affect uh, clinical practice over the next few years. Do you want to come in on this, Stephen, because it's directly overlapping with what you were saying earlier about the fact that uh, you've probably already got things living in you and on you if you live in some of these places that may, when you take antibiotics, influence the development of resistance? Yeah, sure. It's very interesting what Kurt was saying. Yeah, it's com I think it's completely true. I think that so uh, I've, got a, I've got a birth cohort at the moment and we're looking at diarrheal diseases in that cohort of children and actually... Uh, static, setting up some, some work to look at the, the, the microbiome in those children. Uh, we know that children here have a, a fairly dramatic exposure to antimicrobials, uh, even within the first few months of life, we think, and that probably has a fairly dramatic effect on, their, on the development of their flora, but also then leads to probably diarrheal diseases and also probably linking in with what you were talking about earlier, Chris, about other diseases, probably links into respiratory tract infections as well. Um, some of the work that we have done and published on a, on a fairly amateur level to, what, to what's just been discussed is just looking for antimicrobial resistance gene cassettes as part of the, the normal kind of microbiota in people, uh, looking for some fairly substantial you know, cassettes that are uh, ESPL genes and various other things, and we know that somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of, of Vietnamese people in, in, in the city here in Ho Chi Minh City are harboring ESPL gene cassettes as part of their natural microbiota. Curtis? I mean, that, that definitely resonates um, both with some, some work that we've done in terms of profiling um, antibiotic resistance in, in the gut microbiome across cohorts um, and with, with work that, uh, other work that's gone on, for example, at, at NYU with uh, Dan Littman and especially Marty Blazer in terms of understanding mechanistically why those first few years of life seem to be special in terms of major um, antimicrobial perturbations. Um, another actually success story that, that I can mention, I think, in terms of how the um, gut microbiome has already affected clinical practice is also in, in New York, but with uh, Eric Pamer's lab at uh, Sloan Kettering. Um, they've done some great work in understanding how differential exposure to 
um, antibiotics prior to um, bone marrow transplant um, can affect subsequent graft versus host disease and actually made very rapid, um, very large uh, steps in terms of progress of improving patient outcomes for avoiding graft versus host disease by controlling when individuals receive which antibiotics based on what the configuration of their gut microbiome prior to transplant looks like. Uh, so I think that that might be another uh, sort of adult rather than childhood uh, example of um, how understanding the microbiome better as a, as a whole and controlling its perturbation due to environmental factors um, can really have a, an impact in the clinic. And Raja, of course, there is an overlap now we started talking about cancers between various aspects of your microbiome and when that gets disorganized and the risk of developing certain malignancies, isn't there? Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting and expanding area of, uh, uh, of clinical interest in oncology. Uh, this is not related directly to what I do in the lab, but as a clinical oncologist, um, um, you know, treating patients who get bone marrow transplants or, or even patients with solid tumors who get chemotherapy, um, you know, we have a history of misusing antibiotics and steroids and all of the things that mo that we know now modulate the immune system in, in unexpected ways. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's very interesting that uh, monitoring and modulating the microbiota in interesting ways might actually influence treatment outcomes, especially around chemotherapy. And. Stephen, do you find then that, or, or where do you stand on the idea, because what Raj is saying is that um, if you've got people who are immunosuppressed, in other words, you're demolishing people's immune systems because they've had a bone marrow transplant or because they've had an organ transplant or something, or they've had chemotherapy, you're therefore changing the way the immune response responds to various components of your flora and different pathogens. Is there a risk that this could be breeding or creating niches in people for the spawning of new kinds of microbiological traits, which potentially are new pathogens, whether they're bi viral or bacterial? What well, an excellent question. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, so, so, so some data coming out from other groups looking at viral diversity um, uh, from HIV uh, positive, uh, seropositive patients that, that tend to get fairly aggressive and longitudinal uh, diarrheal diseases, which may or may not be associated actually with an inflammatory response. So it may just be the fact that they have whatever we call, you know, an upset stomach. It may not be an aggressive diarrheal disease, but they would have long-term diarrhea. And looking at viral diversity in those for uh, sometimes over several months, you find an enormous turnover, uh, particularly of Khaleesi viruses that seem to uh, respond very well and replicate very well in that environment. Whether they are uh, these people are the breeders of new uh, viral variants which then go on to cause the next epidemic, uh, it hasn't been shown, but I think that it's a very interesting possibility. Jenny, anything else coming in from your perspective or do you want to remind people how they can get in touch if they have any questions? Your microphone's muted. Sorry. Um, so there aren't any questions so far on Twitter. Um, maybe I. Um, so people can tweet us some questions, or they can use their um, Q and A function on the Google Hangout, or you can ask them after the fact, and we can get in touch with the authors and answer them for you that way. Super. Thank you. And uh, Curtis. Coming back from, we've sort of strayed into viruses a bit, but have you actually begun to explore how viruses affect the microbial community? Because there was a very interesting study that was done a year or so ago where people said, look, let's have a look at people who have HIV, because in people who have HIV and AIDS, everyone had obsessed about what the bacteria were doing, but people hadn't really looked at what the viruses were doing, and they found that there was a very big change in the presence of different viruses in the intestine, especially in late-stage HIV. And one theory was that these viruses come up because the immune system is coming down, and this is damaging the intestine, and microorganisms are then straying into the gut, uh, across the gut wall, into the blood, and triggering an immune response, which is what then activates widespread HIV genomes to start to circulate. So there seems to be an interplay play there. Have you begun to look at any of these things? Yeah, there's, there's two uh, maybe interesting aspects to the, the answer there. From the computational side, um, 
we've definitely been working on methods for better, I'd say, non-bacterial detection from microbial community data for a, a while now. Um, there's There's been a, a focus mainly on bacteria because they're, they're easy to measure. There have been good both lab and computational methods to quantify them from sequencing data, from other data for a while now. Um, we're nearing the, the end stages of um, supporting both viral and uh, eukaryotic detection and quantification from sequencing data with some of our tools now. So we've started to, to keep an eye on, on um, the viral and, and also fungal and, and eukaryotic profiles that are detected as a result of that. Um, one of the, the results that, that uh, Skip Virgin pointed out to us recently when we were discussing the, the computational side was hit with him um, with some work that they've done both in terms of viral diversity during HIV or, or SIV um, infection um, in their case. And also, coming back to what we said earlier, um, the degree to which a viral infection at the right time or during the right developmental stage can then change the way the, the body responds to other viral or bacterial infections later on. Um, so again, getting, getting back to this idea of sort of a, an immune priming or a, a hygiene hypothesis-like effect, um, Skip commented that the uh, we should be paying more attention to viruses specifically for the reason that um, they can also serve as the sort of environmental trigger or priming factor and change how the immune system responds to subsequent bacterial invasion or, or even antimicrobial exposure again. And this must be very important in the uh, third world setting, Stephen, because if you've got people who are being challenged with multiple assaults from multiple directions, as Curtis is sort of saying, then there must be a higher risk that you'll get consequences. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, yes. I mean, yes and no. So higher risk of getting consequences such as disease, but then also probably a higher risk of getting a reasonable immune response given the fact that you're longitudinally exposed to these things. So I think it's probably a double-edged sword. Uh, what, what we don't really understand is how that play between risk of exposure and development of the immune system means how your susceptibility changes to infection and the role of the, the gastrointestinal flora on that. Just to pick up another comment that Curtis made actually, we, we've been working on some techniques now um, purifying capsidated nucleic acid from stool samples uh, to actually remove the noise of the, the eukaryotic and prokaryotic DNA uh, and then amplifying the, the capsidated nucleic acid in a clean room to actually then do um, you know, virome type work on stool samples in humans and animals to look at viral diversity. So the techniques actually are, are not far away from being really quite nice now to actually start really, really interrogating both uh, the, 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 um, the bacterial microbiome but also the, the viral uh, microbiome as well. A lot of the techniques that you're all working with must have a lot in common. And Raj, it must be true to say that the diversity we see in the cancer with various mutations being inherited by different groups of cells and so on must have a lot in common with what we think goes on microbiologically. So a lot of the models developed to understand the microbiome must be very similar to the tumor biome. Um, you know, I think maybe in a sort of general way, obviously, they're very different, uh, uh, very different areas of investigation. Um, uh, you know, just to touch back to this issue of uh, immune regulation, so because it, it connects, I think, both with cancer and with uh, and with some of these other things that uh, uh, that are being discussed here. Um, I think one of the sort of, for me at least, as a clinical oncologist, uh, the, the sort of amazing development in, in cancer has been really the fi finally the sort of proof that uh, modulation of the immune system can have remarkable effects on. Uh, uh, on tumor regression. So as many of you know, uh, immune checkpoint uh, targeted agents that hit things like ctl 4 or, or pd l one uh, have shown dramatic durable responses. And, and I think this, uh, uh, this is after many, many years of a uh, of, uh, uh, question as to whether immunotherapy would be, uh, would be effective and how effective it would be. And so I think it's not unreasonable to make the jump that, uh, that other things like the microbiome or other chronic infections that modulate uh, the immune response could have an effect both on um, cancer treatment and perhaps also on cancer development, which is, which is, uh, which is most, more interesting. 
uh, also, of course, people are, are looking at ways to exploit virotherapy, put a virus into a tumour, the, the, the tumour then acts as an excellent home for the virus because it's rapidly dividing tissue, lots of viral progeny, but a, a big immune response. And you get a big immune response to the virus, you get a big immune response to the tumour. And often there's an overlap between epitopes on the tumour and epitopes that the immune system is raising to try to or, or responding to to try to combat the virus. And that means you've got the capacity to do a systemic therapy. You can take down metastases. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting. I mean, I think... Uh, um, you know, uh, especially true for tumors uh, that are driven, for example, by losses of tumor suppressor genes. It's very hard to target something that is gone, and so viruses often, if you can, ha you can engineer viruses so that they will selectively uh, replicate in cells lacking certain tumor suppressors. Uh, you have a chance to cause their direct regression, and, and more interestingly, as you point out, uh, produce tumor damage that can lead to a more robust immune response. Well, at this point. We have to say thank you very much to our three speakers this week. Stephen Baker is from Oxford University, supported by the Wellcome Trust, uh, and he's based in Vietnam, works on gut bugs. Also, Curtis Huttenhauer uh, from Harvard uh, School of Public Health. He develops computational methods uh, for studying computation, uh, for studying communities and microorganisms. And also Rajat Rohatji, who you heard from uh, the biochemistry department at Stanford University, who's an oncologist. They are answering your questions. If you have any more to put to us, we can put them to them after the fact and get back to you, Jenny will tell you who you have to get in touch with, yes. how, how you get in touch with us. We've got one at the minute actually, so we will, um, uh, we can either ask it now quickly or we can send it along to, it's, it's more about the gut microbiome. Up to you, you can squeeze it in if you want. I can, yeah, I think just about, it's someone has asked, is it true that the gut microbiome has an effect on food cravings or response to jet lag? Who wants to have a go at that one? Otherwise I will. <laughs> so I, I can comment briefly. I've, I've not personally seen any results on, on food cravings yet, although it's something that, that I've seen speculated about for years, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's you know, under under the microscope right now. Um, as far as jet lag, there's been some really nice recent work on the gut microbiome linked to circadian rhythms, um, such that unsurprisingly, as just as as we and other organisms have um, a regular systemic immune and and um, uh, regulatory response to light cues and and time of day, the gut microbiome fluctuates with that. Um, the degree to which it's responsive versus causal, I, I don't think is well known yet. Um, so being being able to eat just the right thing to, to cure your jet lag might not be uh, quite there yet, um, but it's also not not the sort of thing that's out of the realm of possibility, um, given how, how strongly uh, the gut microbial community seem to be linked just to circadian rhythm, let alone to disruptions of those in, in something like jet lag. So one wonders whether one is going to see certain kinds of microorganisms or probiotics in your in-flight meal in future. Curtis, what do you think? I, I would recommend not receiving a fecal microbiome transplant for jet lag. I think that's, that's probably overkill. But we'll, we'll see if we can do better than that over the next few years. I don't know. I've had some pretty grotty in-flight meals. I suspect that um, it's possible I was getting a fecal transplant without realizing it tasted like it. Not much of an answer to that, is there? Right, well, let, let me say thank you again to our, our three wonderful guests this week. And also, I now have to say that uh, eLife are ready to announce the third round of nominees from the eLife sponsored presentation series. Andrew Seeds is from Genelia Research Campus at the Howard Hughes M M Medical Institute, and we'll hear about that work. Also, Andrea uh, Brautigam is from the Heinrich Hein Universität and works on the role of the photorespiration during the evolution of the C4 photosynthesis in the genus Flaviviria. We'll try that again, Flaviria. Um, and Kirsty Wan is from the University of Cambridge, where she looks on flagella synchronization. And Mehabor Deribi from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center um, has paper on serum amyloid A is a retinol binding protein that transports retinol during bacterial infection. So we have to say thank you very much to them and congratulate those authors. And thank you very much at home for listening. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Jenny, very much for pulling it all together. Thank you, Chris, for hosting.